The FabFilter Pro Q3 is one of the most hyped EQ plugins of the last five years, and in this video I ask why do people love it so much? I'll be looking at the pros, the cons, when to use it, and more importantly, when not to use it. I'm also going to bust a pervasive myth about this plugin. Is it all just snake oil marketing, or does this actually make your music sound better? So the Pro Q3 is FabFilter's flagship EQ plugin. It's jam-packed with features for sure, but do they actually make your music sound better or worse? Well, I've been using this plugin for years, and the answer seems to be both yes and no. So let me explain why. The first thing you should know is there are two main reasons why so many people love this plugin. The first is the GUI, or graphical user interface, and that basically means how it looks and how we interact with it. As you can see, it's undeniably both beautiful, but it's also useful and largely intuitive. Now, the first thing I personally really love about the GUI is that it's resizable. In my opinion, the ability to resize is an absolute must nowadays. So to all you other software creators out there, if you haven't got your plugins resizable yet, come on guys, get up to speed. We've all got monitors of varying sizes and resolutions nowadays. And if you have a GUI that doesn't resize, you're cutting out a lot of the market. It's like having a shoe shop with just one size of shoes. That would be crazy. In fact, one of the main reasons I switched to using Ableton full time was that the DAW I was using for 10 years years that I shan't name didn't allow me to resize its GUI and I had started using a higher resolution monitor. It put too much strain on my aging eyes. Which is a shame because I absolutely love that software but back to the Pro Q3. One thing worth noting is if you are using the Pro Q3 as an audio unit which is the Apple only plugin format you can only resize it between these different presets. Whereas if you're using it as a VST you can actually drag the corner and resize it to any size that you want. That's not a big issue in the slightest, but I thought it was something worth mentioning. So let's look at the rest of the GUI and find out why it's so quick and intuitive to use. Well, firstly, as you can see, it's pretty clean. Despite all of the features in this plugin, which we'll be getting to very soon, it's pretty uncluttered compared to most EQs. And that's largely because you've got these mini kind of almost tooltip style control panels for each separate EQ node, which pop up when you roll over the different elements. And compare that to the Ableton EQ8, for example, where everything is on display all the time. Now, I find this really useful because then you've got a big clear display of the spectrum analyzer most of the time, and then you can just roll over and edit each particular node as and when you need. You can bypass each separate node like this, which is essential for A-B testing the EQ move you've just programmed in. And you can even solo this specific node so you can just hear the frequencies that you're affecting. You can also change the filter shape from the mini node panel, as well as the frequency, and all of these things can be controlled from the main panel at the bottom too. You can double click or click and drag to create a new EQ mode and hold commands to tweak the Q value of each node as well. You can also drag and edit multiple nodes simultaneously or delete them quickly. Now, another way to delete all the chains is to just skip the current preset forwards and then back to default. Now, another feature that makes it quick to use is that the clicking is context specific. And that means wherever you click within this area, the type of default filter shape it creates will differ. So double clicking within this range creates a low cut. If you go up here and double click, it creates a high cut. You can drag to create a shelf. And then the default node, if you click and drag in this area, is a bell curve. Now, if you think about it, this makes perfect sense because if you're EQing in this range, say from between 100 and 5,000 Hertz, the chances are you are wanting to use a bell curve for boosts, dips, or surgical EQ. Now, if you're at the low end or the high end, the chances are you'll be wanting either a shelf to bring down some of the low end or give it some high end sparkle, or just cut it completely below a certain frequency or above a certain frequency. So that's a really nice feature. I'm not saying it's specific to the Pro Q3. It might be in other EQs, but it's worth noting because it is a really useful feature. Just makes it quicker to use. Now, as well as controlling the nodes from their own panels, you can of course control everything from the main panel too if you prefer. So the filter shape, the frequency, the gain, the Q settings and you can use these left and right buttons to switch between each node and you can see that the color of the node will correspond to that top bar on the main panel as well which is a nice little feature. Now the main control panel is also where you can dive into some of the more advanced features which we're going to be touching upon very shortly. And one other cool feature of the GUI in particular is this piano roll button down here, which when pressed, if I click it now, will show you which note on the keyboard that the frequencies relate to. Now that's really good if you want to tune your EQ 
for example, to the root of the track. And a common example of that might be boosting a kick drum at the fundamental frequency at the root of the track. Now, before we dive into the more advanced features, I just want to talk about how the Pro Q3 actually sounds in comparison to the stock EQ that comes with Ableton. Now, both of them are transparent digital EQs, but I've found that the Pro Q3 does actually sound a little bit better. So I'm going to give you an example now of a low cut in both the Pro Q3 and the EQ8. It's a subtle difference and you'll need some good headphones or monitors to really hear it. But this stuff does matter, especially if it's over the whole mix because cumulatively, it's gonna impact the quality of your final result. So first, let's listen to the difference at the low end. So what I've done on the master channel is I've just added a Pro Q3 and an EQ8, and I've assigned a keyboard shortcut to switch between the two. I've also put on a separate third-party spectrum analyzer after the Pro Q3, so we can have a look and listen to what's going on. So I've done a low cut at 40 hertz on both of these EQs and I've set the slope to 48 hertz on each as well. So let's have a listen and switch between the two. This is very subtle, by the way. That's why I've got this so we can look at it. So if we're hitting about here with our fab filter, let's switch. So if you listen, the fab filter is actually slightly warmer in the low end. Even though it's a very steep curve, it still sounds warmer than the EQ8. Now I'm gonna set up an example where we listen to a high shelf boost. Okay, cool, so I've turned all the other tracks on. We've got the entire piece of music running through the master channel and I've added a 10 decibel boost, which is very extreme, but I want you to be able to hear the difference because it's more audible in the high end. So we've got a 10 dB boost at eight kilohertz with a high shelf and the same Q settings on each of these EQs as well. So first we'll do the Pro Q3, then we're gonna switch to the EQ8. That's the EQ8. Pro Q3. So the EQ8 sounds much more brittle and digital and just a bit nasty, to be honest, when we're doing boosts of this much. So hands down, in terms of how it sounds, the Pro Q3 wins on this front. But having said that, there are times, as I said, when I won't use the Pro Q3, and I'm gonna explain exactly why very shortly. The other really cool thing about the GUI is the colors. Yeah, yeah, sure, they look pretty, but they're also useful because they help you understand what's going on with the advanced features because things can get a bit complicated. So now let's go into the second reason that people absolutely love this plugin, the advanced features. There are pretty much all the features that you would want from a modern EQ, some of which we've just looked at, but there are also some very interesting new features. Now, some can help for sure, but some can actually hinder. So let's have a look at them. So the first advanced feature I want to mention is the analyzer, and I could really have put this into the GUI section of this video, but I actually consider this to be an advanced feature and really, really super helpful. So let me show you through some of the features within the analyzer itself. So as you can see, we've got the shape of the instrument that's playing, which is these chords. And let's just go down to these different analyzer settings here. So at the moment, you can, let's just turn some of these off. If we select the free version, this is gonna show the signal coming in before we've done any EQ moves. And if you press post, you can see now we've got this white outline around it and that's showing the outgoing signal. Now, obviously there's no difference at the moment because we haven't made any changes. So if we take down some of the EQ here, you'll see there's a dis discrepancy now between the signal coming in, which is the dark one, and then the outgoing signal. So that's a really cool way to see the difference that your moves is having on the signal itself. Let's just delete these. Now, the second thing that you might have noticed were all these different channels down here. Now, this is really where the FabFilter Pro Q3 excels, in my opinion, because you can see all the other instances of the Pro Q3 from within the rest of your project simultaneously. I'm just gonna turn off these tool tips. That's another thing that you get in this. You can roll over any aspect and it's gonna show you exactly what it is and explain it to you, but I'm just gonna turn them off because they're a bit distracting. So if we play this, we can see the bass and the kicks and the master channel, the top riff, the extra vox, everything else that's got a Pro Q3 on it. And you can also see whatever sidechain input you decide to put in. So why is that useful? Well, I'm gonna show you the power of this tool because it's pretty amazing. If we play this chords again, we're gonna go through each of these different options within the 
analyzer output, or the analyzer display. But the first is the freeze. So if we freeze this, it's going to collect the signal over time and just work out the average general shape of this. So if you've got something that's quite dynamic in terms of EQ, this is going to give you a broad understanding of the general shape. Now, if you select this one here, this allows you to grab the EQ. So if we roll over for a little bit, it's going to turn purple and then it's going to show us where we've perhaps got resonant peaks and then you can actually drag them down and adjust them if you so desire. It's a little bit annoying because as soon as you kind of roll off one, then it kind of cancels the, the EQ freeze. It's a little bit annoying, but that's what that does. The next is this, which is super powerful. This shows any potential frequency masking from the different instances within your project. So if we turn this on, let's just cancel this one. You can see it's showing where this signal is potentially masking with these other signals from within the project. Now this is particularly useful, for example, if you've got a kick and a bass. So let's go over to the bass, open up the EQ, open up the pre-post here, and as you can see, we've got the frequency masking on, and you can already see in these little displays where there's a potential issue. So we want to make sure that we don't have frequency masking with the kick and the bass because we don't want them to clash too much. So I can press click, kick, and it's now going to show the side chain input from the kick. And it's got this gentle shading of red where there could be potential issues. Now you have to do this by ear. You can't just rely on this perfectly, but it's just a good indicator of where you could have frequency masking. Another indicator that would be very useful would be perhaps between piano and some vocals or other instruments that are going to be sharing similar frequencies. You can decide which one should take priority and maybe dip the second one to reduce that impact. And then of course AB test to make sure you've made it better, not worse. But that is a really, really powerful feature, so you don't just have to rely on your ears when it comes to determining any frequency masking. Oh, had to have a break and go to the gym then. Forgot about my session. Just had to give some bell curve five decibel boosts on my biceps, a five decibel cut on my abs. Anyway, where were we? T, lovely. I was going to show you the EQ matching. It's an amazing tool, okay. Let me, I'm feeling a bit hyped now. Okay, let's look at what the EQ matching does and why I think it's a really cool tool. So, this is particularly good if you're using a reference track in the same genre that you are producing and you like the shape of the EQ curve of that track and you want to at least slightly get yours matching it. So what you have to do is you bring in a reference track. So I've just brought in MK17 because it's in the same style as the Piano House I've, I've written. And then what you do is you need to have a FabFilter Pro Q3 on that, so it's going to show up as a sidechain input. And I'll go to my master channel, open up the FabFilter Pro Q3 there, go to my analyzer options. Let's do post and pre, show them all, and show that as the sidechain input. There we go. And then let's play the initial track. So that's the frequency shape we want for ours. And this is what ours currently is. And you can see what theirs is by the sidechain input. So all you have to do is go to EQ match, make sure that you choose the external, see we can see here my 17 extended club mix, and then we play it. EQ match is analyzing the input and the reference. I'm not sure why it's all the way up there, but let's see. Okay, so over time that's done. Now we can match them like so. Oh, I see. That's the changes it's going to make, and then that other one is what it's going to output at when we match it. So I'm going to press match, and then you can choose how many nodes you want it to apply the match to. So let's have a listen to our track. Okay, it's distorting now because it's boosting it so much. So that is a perfect opportunity to show you the next thing, which is actually the gain reduction, we can auto gain reduce it. So it's going to be outputting at the same input volume. And this is great for A-B testing, making sure the, the moves that you're making with the EQ actually make it sound better rather than just boosting the volume, which can trick your ears into thinking it's better. So I'm going to press that and then it should be lower in volume. So let's add some more mode. 
Okay, so this is the reference track. So this is where we were before. So listen to the difference. Now it might not be better, and this is not something that's super accurate and super appropriate all of the time, but it can help to kind of get you a part of the way there. And if you go to this part as well, you can actually reduce the gain scale. So you might want to perhaps just do it 50%. That's almost like a dry wet control. Just 75%. So that's a really cool feature. So the next really cool feature about the Pro-Q3 is the fact that you've got channel specific nodes. So the default is to edit the whole stereo signal, left and right equally, but you've got the option to actually choose mid-side processing, just affect the left channel, just affect the right channel. And this can be really useful, especially in the mastering stage as well, because you might want to take some of the bass out, just the side channels, and then have a bit more bass in the mid channel. Or you might want to boost the side channels up in the high end to just give a little bit of air and sparkle and things like your reverbs. So this is one of the most loved features, I think, of this EQ by a lot of people. It's one of my most loved features of it. So yeah, it's fantastic. Now the other absolute game changer feature that this EQ includes is being able to work with dynamics. So you can have a sidechain input, you can have dynamic EQ, and it kind of makes it into a bit of a multi-band compressor to a degree. So I'm going to give you an example of that. Let's go back to the master channel. We've got our whole track running through this EQ. So say we wanted to compress the low end slightly, we can drag in a shelf EQ like this. And then we can use this slider here to add some dynamic action. So we can actually compress it as we're ducking it or expand it, turn it into an expander. And it all works quite naturally, so you don't have to go in and start fiddling with it, attack and release. Let's do some for the high end as well. So you can either compress it or expand it. And if you want to learn about compression and expansion and the differences, I'm linking to a video right now. So the dynamics within this EQ is an incredibly powerful tool. Next thing I want to show you is the sidechain option. Okay, so usually a sidechain compressor is used when you want to duck the bass line from the kick, or maybe you want to duck some reverb from the dry vocal. I'm going to show you the example with the kick and the bass. So what we're going to do, instead of a normal sidechain compressor, what the Pro Q3 can do with sidechain mode is actually just duck the specific frequencies you want in the bass from the kick drum. So the first thing we're going to do is select the input signal. So you need to have a Pro Q3 on both the kick channel and the bass channel. And then on the bass channel, I'm going to select the sidechain input to be the kick. Then I'm going to open up the Pro Q3. And we can see here, we've got the kick showing in red and our bass in this gray color. So we want to duck this area here because if we open up this again, and we put on the frequency masking, we can see there's a clash of frequencies there, which is not necessarily unwanted, but there's potentially too much buildup. So what I'm gonna do now is just close that down. I'm gonna add an EQ node there, bring it down. And at the moment, it's just ducking these frequencies in the bass. So if I pull it down really far, you'll hear a big difference. You can hear the low end comes out of the bass. So I want this to be dynamic triggered from the kick. So all I need to do to do that is just pull down this dynamic range there. And we can see this is ducking from the kick. Now I have to open up this auto button and then press this little side chain button. At the moment it's a normal dynamic EQ. So the bass is triggering that dynamic action itself. So what we need to do is press this little button here, and now it's the kick that's triggering this dynamic range. So I can pull down the threshold. And now it's the kick acting as a sidechain compressor. So yeah, very, very powerful tool. Now another really prime feature of this EQ 
is the linear phase mode. So if we open it up on our master channel, you can see here we can choose between zero latency mode, natural phase and linear phase. Now for most channel work, when it's on each separate channel, just leaving it on zero latency is fine. But when you set it to linear phase mode, this is a bit slower, so it uses more CPU, but it comes up with a much better result when it comes to the master. You're adding less artifacting, there's less danger of phasing issues in the low end specifically. And if you want me to make a video delving more in depth into these more technical terms, do let me know in the comments below. For now, just to be said, linear phase mode is great for an EQ on the master channel. Now the EQ8 in Ableton doesn't have linear phase mode. Other EQs do, but the Pro Q3 does. So you can see it's all a bit slower to react, which is why it's not really suitable to use on every single channel. Now I mentioned earlier that some of these advanced features can actually end up being more of a hindrance than a help. So without further ado, let's go on to the cons and then I'm gonna give my conclusion and recommendations of when you should be using the Pro Q3, if at all, and when not. Now I'm gonna go into what I see as the cons of the FabFilter Pro Q3, but remember, these are just my opinions. So you need to be able to make the decision yourself and hopefully the information I'm giving you today is gonna to help with that. So firstly, it's a small thing. You have to open up the interface to see the EQ and make any changes to it. Whereas if you use the EQ8, because it's built into the DAW, you can just make the changes really quickly. You can see what's going on. It's a small thing, but from a workflow perspective, it does make things easier. And if you put a high value on working quickly, as I do, these things do make a difference. Secondly, it uses way more CPU than the stock plugins, right? I mean, it makes sense. Well, it turns out the answer is probably more surprising than you might think. The common myth is that the Pro Q3 does use more CPU than your stock EQ. But I wanted to get to the bottom of this and I actually ran a benchmark and tested the number of instances of the EQ8 from Ableton versus the number of instances of the FabFilter Pro Q3 I can run before my CPU started running into difficulties. So here's a chart to show my findings. As you can see, I could actually run almost twice as many instances of the Pro Q3 than I could the Ableton EQ8. This blew my mind. So pfft, we can actually remove that myth from the cons column. So rather than the CPU usage, the second con is that the advanced features can actually sometimes be a distraction and more of a hindrance than a help. Technically, this is tied to human psychology rather than the plugin itself, but I see so many people using all these advanced EQ techniques when they could have fixed the sound much closer to the source. So if you're spending three hours on a dynamic EQ for your kick, the chances are you probably just need to pick a different kick sound. Now this isn't a criticism of the Pro Q3, this is more just my observation of human nature. If we've spent money on fancy tools and we've got lots of them at our disposal, we almost feel obliged to use them, right? Even if they're not the best solution for the job. So the most important thing when opening up any EQ is to have an intention and a reason for adding the EQ beforehand. Then you've got a goal to work towards rather than just throwing on a fancy EQ and twiddling controls and hoping it's going to sound better. And what's more, if you've spent three three hours adding dynamic EQ to a hi-hat sound, the sunk cost fallacy starts kicking in and then you're even more reluctant to just delete the EQ and start again because you've invested so much time into it already. But remember, you cannot polish a turd, but you can roll it in glitter. So with all that being said, here are my recommendations of when to use the FabFilter Pro Q3 and when not. So because we absolutely exploded that myth about the CP usage, as long as you're aware of the features and, and just instinctively dive into the more advanced stuff for the sake of it, I would recommend using the Pro Q3 on pretty much any channel in your mix or every channel your go-to channel EQ. Secondly, I would definitely use this EQ if I did know there was complex work to do because there are so many features and it's all laid out so beautifully. As I always teach my students, I always recommend trying to get the sound as close as to what you want, nearer to the source, without having to rely on other tools like EQ and compression because you've just got so much more control. But having said that, there are definitely situations when you will need a dynamic EQ, when you will need these sidechain features, and it usually revolves around recording live instruments like vocals, guitars, or drums. Because of the large dynamic variation and the modes of the room in which you're recording it and loads of stuff like that. So sometimes having that control is essential and this is a great plugin for that. Finally, I would also use this EQ in the mastering stage for the linear phase options that I just mentioned and the EQ matching tool. So when would I personally not use this? Well, one, if you're working with another producer who doesn't have this tool and you need to share the projects with each other. Now that's not much of an excuse because if you are a serious producer, it's a good idea to have some of these tools that a lot of people have just so that you don't run into these problems. But having said that, I remember what it was like when I was starting out. I was completely flat broke 
and having to spend more money on a plugin instead of using the stock plugins was just not an option. And you might be in that situation. That's pretty much why I always stick to stock plugins in my YouTube videos, just so as many people as possible can get value from them without needing to have fancy third party plugins. And you can check out some of the other videos on my channel. I've got hundreds of tutorials of all different styles of music, which could help you out. Now, the other instance I will reach for a different EQ from the Fab Filter Pro Q3 is if I want to impart some more character to the sound, because the Pro Q3 is a really good transparent digital EQ. But if you want to impart more character, I would reach for an analog modeled EQ, which is going to add some more harmonics and give it the sound of the signal being pushed through hardware equipment. I'll usually reach for one that models a famous old hardware EQ, like a Pultec, for example. Now, all of these are just my own opinions. You might think I'm completely wrong. So let me know in the comments, what do you think of this plugin? What do you love about it? What do you hate about it? And do you use it yourself? So now you know pretty much what I think about the Pro Q3, all of the advanced features, and more importantly, that those features aren't necessarily what's gonna get your music actually sounding good. Now, the truth is, if your music doesn't sound as good as you would like, even with just the stock plugins that you have, there's probably just a few mistakes you're making that could actually be ruining your mix. So I recommend watching this video here to find out what those mistakes are and how you can instantly fix them. But don't click on it yet. Make sure to subscribe if you're serious about improving your music production skills. Okay, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you over there.